The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Well, as it turns out, horrible things overseas. The actual adaptation of those pages was an explosive next to the lithium. No wonder they went like a Roman candle when they went off. Not good. I know it looks like that uh, Israel has the enemy on the run. And, and I would love to believe that this would put an end to the misdeeds of Hezbollah and Houthis and Hamas and Iran. But I can't help but to perceive this will only inflame the situation. They're going to draw in larger forces and their retaliation is going to be ruthless. I say that because they made a comment yesterday that they would, in proportion to what happened to them, that they would strike against Israel. It's very troublesome because civilians were hurt, which means children and civilians are on the list. Not good. Plus, biblically, you know, I, I know I'm beating a horse here, but I'm always drawn back to the book of Daniel. That's a very uh, insightful but sorrowful chapter, chapter 11 is, because it really shows you a development of things happening in the Middle East that will no doubt uh, get out of control very quickly. And according to the book of Daniel, the upon the return of this confederate, which goes against Israel, right before Daniel 11.31, when they set up the abomination of desolation, I, I, I know the argument of a great many people. And a lot of people have their views on what, may, what must take place. Now, we're going to differ in views slightly in this. A lot of people feel that the abomination of desolation cannot be set up until the temple is built so that uh, the one that goes into the temple of God can show himself as God. But I can't help but to think of the changes from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the fulfillment the translation, or, or I'll say the transformation of physical to spirit from the Old to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they had temples indeed, physical temples. In the New Testament, the temple became those who inhabit Christ, those who inhabit the Holy Spirit. That's why what the apostles said. He said that, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. I, I just can't discount that one. Right, as having a high relevance in the new t in as far as the abomination of desolation is set up, and I thought about something. You know, for a long time, people have been trying to see physical things that mark the end of days. Right, they've been looking for these physical manifestations of things. Most of the fulfillment of prophecy in the New Testament. Besides, well, you know, aside from Israel becoming a nation again, has been largely spiritual. For example, the four horsemen that you read about in Revelation is largely, I believe, largely spiritual. And in fact, I believe in Matthew, the Lord spoke about the four horsemen, even in the book of Matthew. And if we put that in a context, or we look, and I'm not trying to convince you, I'm just proposing something here, something that I strongly believe. And I'm not discounting a physical temple. I am not. I'm not one who will discount what somebody else sees biblically. So don't mistake them. Kind of like yesterday. Don't don't mistake yesterday's conversation for, you know, a, a stubborn person who only believes something in one way, no. But it must, in the fulfillment of Scripture, it must be Scripture. And it must be Scripture according to to scripture. In the Bible it says the Bible is to be understood spiritually. Right? You understand the Bible spiritually. Well, what's the opposite of spiritually? Physically. Right? Or logically. Or of the mind. In the Bible it says a carnal mind is enmity against God. Carnal mind is your natural mind, your normal mind. What's the other mind? The mind of Christ is the other mind. So that's a very important distinction. And when we look at things logically, we can only see earthbound things. We can't see spiritual things, nor the manifestation of spiritual things. 
I, I firmly believe this was one of the mistakes of the Pharisees at the time of Christ. They could only see things in the physical realm. They had forgotten about the spiritual connotations of prophecy themselves, and so they couldn't see Christ. They were spiritually devoid. They were empty of the Spirit. But when you see scriptures where it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And when you read something like, This person of doom, this Antichrist, will go into the temple of God proclaiming himself as God. I want you guys to think about something. There are too many times in history where a person gets into the hearts and the minds of individuals. Suppose one of you who believes in Christ, that somebody swoops your heart away. In other words, somebody convinces you so much that you become all about them. Kind of like what happened with Obama, kind of like what happened with Trump. People were overwhelmed by them to the point where they had entered into the people. And suppose a person is all in your heart and all in your mind, and their way of life begins to take over how you see life itself or how you see things themselves. Wouldn't that be a person entering or stepping foot into the temple of God, and then they would show themselves as God or show themselves to be the highest authority in your life? or take the place of God in your life. I see that all the time, how men or human beings who are of notable stature to a lot of people step into the hearts and the minds of people to the point where people almost worship them as God. I see that all the time. I saw that with Obama. I did. I saw that with Obama. I saw that with Trump. People worshipped these two men as though they were gods. They really did. And why do I say that? Because people had pushed Christ aside of the principles. They Well, here's one big thing. Now, don't get angry, but here's one big thing. When we start to justify a person utilizing the word of God to do it, then that person in that moment is higher than the living God. There is no case where we should ever justify the deeds of a person by the word of God as though the word of God is the approval of that, you know, also agrees with that person. No way, Jose. That should never be. That should never be. We should never use the Word of God as though the Word of God is also supportive of the person we like. Word of God supports. Truth. God is the origin of truth. We may come alongside that or not, but make no mistake, the Most High is not for our flesh, nor of these things of flesh. The Lord God is holy. And so people deify these people on earth, doing what prophecy said they would do. They worship these people as though they are God. Just think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. Because, I, listen, I know that there have been some people in my life that I've respected. And if I wasn't careful, I would have put them on a pedestal. Not a good thing to do. Anyway, so this figure, this Antichrist figure, if we're not careful... We won't even, you know, that guy won't be revealed to us because we'll be lost in our worship of men. We will not continue with the conversation. In the Middle East, these things are happening, the Bible being the anchor, the big anchor. It's important, I believe it's important that we always remember the scriptures so that we have this anchor point of truth to draw upon. Like times like today, nobody, you really don't know what's going to happen in the Middle East. We know some sort of escalation will take place. We just don't know exactly how that will take place, right? We don't know if that's going to lead to, you know, total devastations or not. I can tell you that the approval has been given for Israel to go for their enemies. So they have high support. Something happened today. At the same time when they approved to Israel, giving them high support to go forward. The rejections came in. The sympathy of people concerning these hurt people from these exploded painters is starting to take effect. And time is running out. I'll tell you something. When that full sympathy kicks in, Israel is going to be hated at a hate level nobody has ever seen before. They're also trying to implement a two-state, well, let's say a different, not a two-state solution. No. But they're trying to do something very different, and I fear they're going to force it. They're going to change the face of Israel, as we all know it. That's why the Bible is so important. It is so confusing over there when things go back and forth like that, right? But the Bible remains an anchor. It does. 
this situation has inflamed all those around her. Even Jordan is upset with Israel. Do you guys know that? Jordan is. Daniel 31 says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination and make it desolate. So there's a promise and a prophecy in the book of Daniel. Uh, it, actually, in, in all the prophetical books, there's a prophecy that Israel must be destroyed once more. Do you guys know that? Once more, they're going to have to be destroyed. And that's prophecy. But why so? See, it's important to me that we understand why God is doing what he's doing. And he allows us to know. It is no good just to say, okay, Israel is going to be overrun. I think it's important at this point in time that people understand why it must be overrun. Because how many, if you guys don't understand what God is doing, that's going to cause confusion. If you don't understand what God is doing with Israel, you're going to be messed up when it actually happens. And I have this, there's a, there's a caution in me to cover the subject well, at least, you know, with my part, before it happens. Because when it happens, there's going to be a confusion at a height we've never witnessed. Can you imagine how many people are going to be heartbroken? If you saw Israel overrun, if you saw the people bloodied, if you saw fires everywhere, if you saw an enemy overtake Israel, wouldn't that mess with your faith? Wouldn't it make you pause for a moment to say, I wonder, you know, this is awful. And how many people out there, listen, how many people out there, if you've been a part of COT, you're not like that. But before, you know, I kept going in this one direction concerning Israel, a lot of people, they really do believe nothing can happen to Israel. That's what they believe. They believe that nothing can happen to Israel. They honestly believe. And what do you think is going to happen when they see Israel on fire? What do you think is going to happen when they see the enemies of Israel in Jerusalem and they have it under siege? And what do you think is going to happen to believers when that, when that stays that same way for three and a half years? Or by estimation was given to us in the word of God. What do you think is going to happen to the average person who does not know what God is doing with Jerusalem and his friend? You know, when the book of uh, Joel, there's a cry in Jeremiah. There's talk of confusion. See, even in the book of Jeremiah, it states something that is, if, if, you, if you read too fast, you'll miss it. But it's a, it's a thought from the people, from the prophets themselves. They say, ah, oh, God, you have deceived us. They will say, you have deceived us. We've been misled. We thought nothing could happen to Israel. Why does all this misfortune come against us? You guys ever read that? I mean, it's like a wake-up call of wake-up calls when that takes place. When you start reading um, in Jeremiah, you start reading that. And that, by the way, that happened more than one time. Happened more than one time. The people today, if they were to see that today, which they will shortly, what do you think will happen to their faith? I firmly believe. Because, see, I don't like that idea of folks falling away. You know, when you read that, that day shall not come unless there come a falling away and that man of perdition be revealed. I don't like that. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like that. I don't like the idea of a person having faith, all of a sudden not having faith. I don't like that. I don't like the idea that people are going to fall away and not believe anymore. I don't, I don't like that. I'm not okay with that. That, that is, that's awful. And I believe that people will not have they're just not being properly educated. There are people out there right now. They're doing, they have read the scriptures, but they honestly believe that nothing will happen to Israel. I hear it all the time. They say nothing can hurt the apple of God's eye. That's the truth. It will always exist so long as the Father's there. But many don't understand what God is doing with it. And it's important that people understand why God will permit this. I was talking today to some folks. They are not aware that Israel is prophesied, that Israel is going to be in dire straits again. For some reason, they can't rectify that within themselves. They can't see it coming. They don't believe it. I firmly believe it's going to cause. Now, the Lord gave us a warning. He said to those 
who have more is going to be given and to those who have little even that little bit is going to be taken away that was in regards to a person's faith it was in regards to a person's knowledge of the word a time will come when the issues will be so challenging that a person only has a little faith even that little bit is going to be taken away it is in fact the story of the virgin I know everybody has their version, but I cannot help but to think, as I stated at the beginning of COT to this day, that that oil comes at a high price. And the only way to obtain that oil is to go live your experience, to have deliverance in your life that you trust the Most High, that you have confidence in the Most High, that you still fear the Lord. And I know that fear of the Lord is very, is running dry in these days. Many people do not fear the living God anymore. But think about something. That flame is your faith. Because the flame, right, the lamp burning, think about something, that lamp burning. When it's burning, that enabled the five wise virgins to get to the door and to go through that door, and then the door was shut. They didn't shut the door. Somebody else did. So it allows them, faith allows them entrance. What about the five foolish ones? The flame kept going out. The flame would not stay lit, so they could not see. We're to walk by what? We're to walk by what? Faith. Not by sight. That flame allows you to see by way of faith. That your faith, which is just, if we're not to walk by sight, and we are to walk by faith, then isn't faith just like seeing in the spiritual realm? Think about it. You're not to walk by sight to walk by faith so faith could be said to be a whole new set of eyes you're to walk by faith that flame is allowing one to see that flame i believe is faith you cannot enter into the kingdom of god without faith you cannot please god without faith i believe that flame is faith so what is the oil the oil keeps the flame burning and why were the five foolish virgins told to go and buy some oil they weren't told to go and get it. They were told to go and buy it. Which means it comes at a cost. Well, let's examine something. What gave you your oil? Why do you still have your faith? Because you have been through things. A person who has gone through a lot, when they go through things, a lot of things, they have a tendency to have a relationship with the living God. Plus, they have experience with deliverance. Their experience with the living God through all their trials and tribulations, no other thing yields oil like trials and tribulations. All of what they lived through has increased their faith because of deliverance, because of the Lord interceding into their lives in various ways. So the only way to get oil is to go and pay the price for it because your faith, that oil that keeps your faith going, came at a high price. It did came at a high price. Do you know how much you had to go through to get that oil? Every time you go through a trial or a tribulation, there's a drop of oil in your lamps to keep your flame going. And that's more fuel to keep your faith going. And when your faith is needed at the end, people who have gone through nothing, who have no experience with God's deliverance, are not going to be able to believe that God can deliver them. And their flame is going to go out. When things get harsh or they get rough, even in your own lives, you've experienced what it is not to have faith that God will deliver you. See, if you worry in a situation, that's not faith. If you have faith in a situation that God will deliver you, it's impossible to worry, isn't it? It's impossible to be afraid. If you know that God's going to protect you and deliver you, it's impossible to be afraid. It's impossible to worry. In the beginning, you worried a lot. You were afraid. After so many trials and tribulations, you become immune to the works of darkness to the point where it does not cause you that type of fear or doubt anymore. So when something does happen, you'll say, well, God will deliver us from this. Well, how do you know? Because he delivered me all throughout these events of my life. I have faith in him. See, that oil keeps your faith going. No wonder they said you've got to go back and buy some. You got to go back and buy some. They didn't say get some. They said buy some. The Bible tells us that trials and tribulations 
work something in your life, it gives us a key right there. That's why it says glory in tribulation. Then it gives you a list of things that tribulation or troubles in your lives produce. It is beautiful. And if you think of your own personal life, if you're a believer, your life has been designed. And he called, he also qualified. You're predestined. Everything is designed. Nothing has been a mistake in your life that you've gone through. Nothing. It's been carefully positioned, placed, and planned. But you may become what you are destined to become. That's why some of us have unshakable faith right now, so far. Some of us can stand in the face of death, and they can, the, 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 the folks who capture you or tell you to don't say anything about Christ, you can clearly disregard that. Without fear, somebody could point a gun in your face and you wouldn't, you wouldn't even sweat. Those are folks who know the deliverance of the living God. But what about those who don't know that deliverance? They're going to sweat. I'm telling you now, they're going to be frightened. Those of you who have gone through things in your youth, you've seen dark times in your youth, and the Lord has delivered you from them. You have experience with darkness that one can only get if they walk in your shoes. See, to get that oil, you have to go back and live your whole life. You don't get the oil overnight. You get that oil over the course of your life. And it comes at a high price. It, come, it comes with a cost. And the cost is this process. It yields oil. And that's something. So, back to what I was saying. This time that's coming to see Jerusalem in distress. Many people, there are some people who don't have oil. Now remember, all the virgins were awakened all at one time. Some had oil, some did not. How can you not have oil? Well, it's when you go through these troubles in your life and you, by way of sinfulness, get your way out of those situations. Did you guys know that when, you're, when you befall a circumstance, when something, when you have a circumstance, I can't be the only one who has seen this, by the way, but when you're in a circumstance, when a trial, when troubles hit your life, there are two ways out. You can do it the right way, which, by the way, is the most embarrassing way. It takes longer than normal. And there's no, you know, you don't really comprehend the whole process. Or you can do it the sinful way, which always, for some reason, promises to get this thing out of your hair and you can move on with your life. If you do it the righteous way, normally it's embarrassing, very exposing, you know, things like that. If you do it the sinful way, you can rush it and get it out of your hair. I believe that a lot of people don't have oil because when their trials and tribulations came, they got out of them the sinful way. I believe that. They wanted a quick end to their troubles. And they did anything to put an end to it. Normally, you have to sin to do that. Those who did it the right way, it required patience. Lots of nights of tears. Things you did not understand. And it looked hopeless. Yet you were delivered. And you have a lot of people without oil. A lot of people without oil. And again, my point is when, when they behold, when they see what's happening in Jerusalem, those without oil, I believe many of those are going to be the ones in Revelation that you read about. You know in Revelation when you read and it states that they mocked God, that they blasphemed God, the people of the earth blasphemed God, they blamed God and those who dwell in the heavens. How do they have such knowledge of the living God? Because they once walked with him. They fell away. That's what I believe. They fell away. Now, many people don't talk about that falling away. They don't. They don't talk about the time when people are going to lose faith, when people are given over to a reprobate mind. But God said it plainly to us. He's going to make a separation. It is indeed part of the harvesting of the wheat and the tear. It is indeed part of the harvesting. I think it's important we understand all those processes so that we have clarity on them by way of the word. I think that's important. And I really think it's important we understand what God has decreed upon Israel. How many out there know, first of all, is there a, is there a reason God will have Jerusalem trampled underfoot 42 uh, months, three and a half years? Anybody out there? Is, is, there an, is there a reason you know of that that would, uh, that would take place? That's pretty hard, but we can see what happens. Have you guys ever read Jeremiah, the whole book?
book of uh, Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah is when God decreed that they would be exiled into Babylon, right? To be kept for a season, for a little while. But the Lord said something. Listen to this. The Lord said something. This was a word towards Israel. Listen, towards his people. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return to me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. You won't be dispersed. He said, And thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nation, this is most important, and, and when they do this, it says, And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Well, thus saith the Lord. Isn't that amazing? That was Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. If God's people at that time would have put away their abomination and turned to the living God, the whole world would have been healed through Israel. The whole world would know the Lord God through Israel. Isn't that something? So what eventually happened? Because the Lord gave them declaration after declaration after declaration. But they didn't do it. They kept their abominations. They declined to hear the words of Jeremiah and the prophet. And so the Lord made a declaration against them. Something he said he would not repent of. They did a great evil in that land. And he said he would require something of them at the end of days. It's called the indignation. And it must be fulfilled by the living God. Listen, the indignation of the Most High is because of what Israel continued to do. And the Lord said he would not repent of it. So the indignation at the end times is specifically for Israel. During the time of the indignation, he said after he allowed the enemy in, after the enemy purged all that was truly false, only after that time would he be satisfied. And then after he is satisfied, then he would remember his land and pity the people. And all those who set their hearts against Israel would pay for it dearly. But the indignation is promised. See, that's why you read you, in the Bible and prophecy, you read about the indignation. You read about that designated time. You know, in the Bible, when it says, for the end is not yet. But that, that is appointed. Like in, uh, uh, in Daniel 11.24, um, I'm sorry, Daniel 11, chapter, verse 27 says this, And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. It won't prosper, it says, For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. That's in the book of Daniel. That's a strong verse. Let me tell you why. It says, it says Both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, to do something not so good to the other. <laughs> and they shall speak lies at one table, promises. God tells us that only he can keep promises. That's what he tells us. He says, and he says, but it shall not prosper, for the end shall be at an appointed time, at the time appointed. That's powerful because these two kings could cause the end. Their disagreement could cause the end. Do you hear me? But he said, not yet. For the end is at an appointed time. I think that's powerful. Gives your insight into these two individuals. Now, in the context of Daniel, he's talking about the king of the north and the king of the south. The king of the south, it is said to be the prince of the holy covenant. There's only one holy covenant in Israel. There is no other holy covenant just one. So that's held off. Then he says, then shall he return to, the, to his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. So his talks don't prosper. So he goes back to his own land with great riches, it says. So he's increased. You know, in the Middle East, you've been seeing that. 1947, you're looking at ragtag places. You really are. And every time there was contention with Israel, somebody was enriched by it. Back during that time, 1947, Turkey was not in the shape it is now. None of those nations were in the shape they are now. But they are now. 
of all the times Turkey is really established now. So as the Northern Quadrant is established now, and all of them have money. All of them do. It's one of those incredible things. He says, at the time appointed, he shall re return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter, for the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant, hatred against the Holy Covenant, hatred, indignation, hatred against the Holy Covenant. Now listen to this. This is the giveaway. He's going to go to his own land with hatred against the Holy Covenant. We know that's against Israel. And it says, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence or information with them who forsake the Holy Covenant. What is amazing is, for the first time, we see who truly has indignation against the Holy Covenant. This is important to point out. They have indignation against the Holy Covenant. What is the Holy Covenant? Something made between God and the people. They have a hatred toward the agreement with God and the holy people. Do you know what Iran's hatred is really of? Is it really against Israel? No, it's against the holy covenant. Do you know that? Iran hates the fact that Israel claims God has given them that land. That by way of a covenant, that's their land. They hate it big time. They hate it big time. What about Hamas and Hezbollah? Same thing. They hate it. Even Turkey hates it. Saudi Arabia hates it. Egypt, they don't like it either. And there are people here in the USA that don't like it. They don't like that holy covenant. So there's truly, for the first time, where a person can really know the mind of these Middle Eastern nations, there's a true hatred of the holy covenant. That's why they continually say, we're going to burn, we're going to take that. Listen, they want to take the land. They believe that they were given that land by the living God, by their God. They hate the idea that the God of Israel has a covenant with them concerning that land. They are against it. They hate it. And so guess what? They believe Israel is a devil that usurped that land. That that land is truly theirs, and Israel is the devil, and we, the USA, are the big devil. See, the whole argument is based in a type of religious faith. You can see that so clearly. So clearly, they hate it, and so they want it for themselves. They believe that they are the rightful heirs of that land. They hate the agreement with the God of Israel and Israel concerning that land. They voice that all the time. So let's continue to read those. It says, it says um, when the ships of Shittim come against them, it says, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. We see that happening now. He'll have intelligence with them who forsake the Holy Covenant with all those nations who share in their ideology of their joint hatred, their strong dislike against Israel. Listen, so 31 is it, it says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. They're going to place the abomination, the object that makes it empty. And such as do wickedly, all those who do little sneaky things against Israel, it says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries. So all those who take advantage of Israel. And, and listen, because the indignation is against the covenant, so we know those nations are Islamic nations. In the Islamic faith, they do not believe God has granted Israel due to their lineage, that land. They believe God granted them that land. This is in their faith. What do we keep reading? That they have a hatred against the Holy Covenant. That they have a hatred against the Holy Covenant. It is the covenant they have hatred to. Now, in order for them to set it right, they've got to take it. And so that's what they do. They go in and pollute. That They go in and just pollute the place, take it over. With many armies acting as one. With many 
proxies acting as one. My goodness, we see it. We see it forming right before our eyes. We see the proxies. And what just happened is going to glue those proxies together in a joint effort against Israel. Watch and see. I mean, it's all the formation of it is happening right now. Let's continue to read and says, And such as do wickedly against the Holy Covenant shall he corrupt my flatteries. So he's going to talk to those which he is doing. This is happening right now. And then he says, But the people that do know that God shall be strong to exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword. Yet they shall fall by the sword. So yes, the people that do know their God will be strong and do exploits. But it says, And yet, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. That's not good. That's what people will see. What are they going to see again? They're going to see the people of Israel fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days, three and a half years, 42 months. They're going to see it because they're not really familiar with this. Or somebody has changed their eschatology, making it seem like this is, you know, for something else. They're not going to believe it when it takes place. And when it takes place, it's going to do something to their faith. That's when people are going to get scared and desperate. Because they'll say, wait a minute, just like some of you, when you were young and you grew up, you say, wait a minute, God didn't protect me in that thing that happened to me in my youth. And I'm kind of nervous he may not protect me now. Isn't that how certain people think? Isn't that the truth? If we search our minds, those people who have gone through great things when they were young, you know that eats at you and it scares you to pieces. Well, guess what? Just think of a bunch of people thinking in that same pattern. See, this has to be addressed. Can you imagine if no one encouraged you by way of faith with the truth that you would have trust in Yahshua HaMashiach? If no one did that, if no one talked about these subjects, if you were to see that with your own eyes, you would be frightened. No matter how much you believe, you'd be frightened. Because you would begin to entertain that question. Has the devil overcome the living God? All of that. Because people read this so fast. They do. When they get to this section, they read it fast, skip over things. They don't want to read the whole thing. They don't. Have you noticed that? They don't. They don't want to deal with it. That's one of the most important things to deal with. So it says uh, they're going to fall by sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. This is God's people. It says, now when they shall fall, they shall be helped with little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Yes, when you tell somebody from afar, we're going to do everything we can for you. We're going to do everything we can. They don't do anything. It says, and some of them understanding shall fall. Listen, though. Listen to me carefully. Some of them understanding of those who fall, some of them understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for an appointed time. See that? A purging. Just like Isaiah 5. You guys ever read Isaiah 5? You ever read Isaiah 5? God will purge his vineyard. Let's continue then because we have to know this. It says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper. He's going to be effective. Till the indignation be accomplished. You see that? Until the indignation be accomplished. Until the indignation be accomplished. So he's only, listen, th this is something you need to know. This Antichrist is only going to be effective during the purging till the indignation be accomplished. What does that tell you about the Antichrist? Is it God's will that the Antichrist be the Antichrist? Well, see, I'm going to that controversial mode again. Yep, it is. It's God's will that the Antichrist be the Antichrist. Yep. See, a lot of people think that the Antichrist is coming. And somehow God has to put his uniform on and get ready for the Antichrist. That, that, that's not what's happening. Would you guys be surprised if I were to go just jump off a limb and tell you that God orchestrates the Antichrist coming? 
What would you guys think? It gives you, it gives you shudders, doesn't it? Huh? Didn't it give you the chills? Why would he say that? Why would he say that? Let me read something to you now. Keep your, keep your place in Daniel. Chapter 11, keep your place. I'm going to read something to you guys. I'm going to read something to you because you deserve to hear it. Because it's not read enough. It is not read enough. It is not read enough. And it needs to be known before the breakout happens. Because a breakout is about to happen. And people will weep between the porch and the altar. And many will not understand. And, and many are going to just fall away. Just hear me on this. I'm reading. This is scripture. It's not my words, not your words. This is scripture. You ready? And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast. These shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God should be fulfilled. Who put it in their hearts? To hand over the authority and power of their respective nations. God put it in their hearts. Yes, he did. For what? It's a fulfilling of the indignation of the living God, his declaration, made in the book of Jeremiah towards Israel for what they did. Because what they did is unforgivable. Isn't that something? So, God is doing this. So let me tell you this real quick. The devil can't do anything unless God gives him room to do something. Stop fearing the devil. You know, there are people in this world right now, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, they're in the pulpit and they sit there and tell people, respect the devil. I'm not going to respect the devil. The devil can do his own business. I will respect the most high. I will resist the devil. How about that? That was our instruction to resist him, not to respect him, not to regard him, but to resist him, period, point blank. I'm not going to think about him. I will not fear him. God told us, resist the devil, didn't he? So there you go. Not doing anything else. Now listen, somebody says, well, I just don't want to see him suffer. It may be controversial. If we could all see the truth, you would say, Lord, let your will be done. Even in the middle of their harshest suffering, you would say, God's will be done. And you would glorify God for it with no sorrow in your heart. People have sorrow because they cannot see the true entity walking around in that flesh. That's why. Never forget God is separating the wheat from the tares. Just because it looks sweet and innocent does not mean it is sweet and innocent. Hitler looked sweet and innocent. Did he not? Was he sweet and innocent? Let's continue. So this this guy, this king, shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. He's only going to prosper. It's only going to work for a season, three and a half years, until the indignation be accomplished. <laughs> it says, Neither shall he regard the god of his father, nor the desire of a woman, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. It says, but in his estate or in his place. It's very important. Oh, this is so important. But in his estate, he shall honor a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God. He's going to honor the God of forces. Do you guys know just in recent times? What do you hear in recent times? Science, 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 science. And what do they say? You have to believe the science. You must trust the science. We're going to do everything by science. Science, science, science. What do you find in science? What are people studying in science? The natural forces don't they? The forces of the world, don't they? And what do they make people do, especially with this green initiative? They make people change their lives to appease the forces. In other words, when it comes to the saving the earth, right? They cause people to alter what they're doing and think about what they're doing. For what, though? To appease. Appease the earth. 
You're not making the connection, are you? It's not that they hug trees and love the planet, because God said, I will destroy those who destroy the earth. So make no mistake about that. That's what your father said. I will destroy those who destroy the earth. But what are they doing? They're causing people to change everything. And they're bringing terms back like Gaia, like Mother Earth. And what are people doing now when they bought those terms back? I'll tell you what they're doing. They're worshiping the earth again. They say the, they're worshiping the earth like it's a living entity. They're apologizing to the earth. That's what all this green stuff has led to. That's something. And they tell people today, you got to trust the science. They don't care about prophecy. They said, you better trust the science. And when you speak to some of these people, they say, well, we don't care. We, we know what the Bible says. We know what faith says. But you have to trust the science. Well, here's the funny part. The science they're telling you to trust are their own findings. Can't you hear it? They're not telling you to worship the science because they don't use that word. They're telling you to trust the science, which is just like worship the science. Stick this emblem on your car. Show everybody you represent uh, 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 climate change. The big fight over climate change. And what do they tell you? Climate change is real. Yield. Stop to climate change. I know climate change is real because the climate's changing. Duh. If we burn up a bunch of plastics, that can't be good for the air. Duh. If we're sitting there burning too many fossil fuels, that can't be good for the air either. Duh. But what do they tell you, though? Pause your life and bow to climate change. Don't they? Kill for climate change. It's them. That's what they're doing. The ones with all the money are calling it climate change. The ones with all the money are saying you have to trust and believe in the science. In Congress, they sat there and had those hearings. They said, you have to believe in the science. That's what they said. What did we read here? He worships the God of forces. The God of forces. A strange God whom his fathers knew not. Well, guess what? If his fathers did not know this God, then that God is not Allah. That God is not anything we're familiar with. So even the Muslim. They're not going to be worshiping Allah because it says this thing is going to worship a God his fathers knew not. They did not. They don't know what this guy is worshiping. So it's not anything traditional. It is something new. It is the God of forces. What is the God of forces? Can't you see it? What governs everything? Physics. God or master of the forces is why they built CERN. Why do you think Sheba's up there? They have taken science that no one will dispute and they're causing people to worship science as though it's a living entity. And it's guiding everything that people are doing. And people are proud of the science they have. Now, come on, folks. The rule of force something never worshipped before and that's only a piece of it because if you think it stops with science you're mistaken if it's a god their fathers knew not it is not islam it's not catholicism it's something brand new it's not buddhism it's not what it is you guys starting to see it and they're driving this point home all the time and people are doing it to worship science, to worship the God of forces, which is essentially this new thing that's come into power. They're causing people to adjust their lives to the findings produced by science. Do you hear me? Here's the trick. All they have to do is say is science and people act like it's been there all this time. No. These are man-made conclusions they're causing people to follow. In so doing, people are worshipping those who are behind the numbers, those who are behind these numbers. And I have to tell you, the numbers have been failing left and right. And the numbers, these people who are behind that have failed to predict anything accurately. And they change it all the time. But it gives them absolute control. You guys see where all this is headed. 
where this guy is worshiping the God of horses and everybody else is too. And in the book of Revelation, you, know, you see the same thing, the exact same thing. You see it. In his estate, he's going to honor the God of horses. And God as fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. We're going to cover that whole subject. Listen, thus shall he do the strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall listen to this, and he shall cause them to rule over many and, to, and divide the land for gain. Do you guys hear that? And divide the land for gain. You know how people say, well, you know, nobody can part the land of Israel. It will be divided. It will be. The plans are being drawn up right now. All countries are in agreement. Do you know that? Do, do you guys even know that Israel is making its last stand? They even understand this is their last chance. They're doing it. And so what we see about to happen is the unthinkable. Because while everything is happening, I want to tell you guys something before I go a step further. When was Hitler born? Don't give me the date. Not the date. What were the conditions that Hitler grew up in? Anybody know? What was happening? There's something you need to know. You need to know the conditions in which a tyrant is born, in which a tyrant is raised. You ready for this? Hitler was born when his country did not have a concrete identity. In fact, all tyrants are born when their respective country has a conflict regarding their identity. In other words, when Hitler was growing up, he could see the arguments, number one. But then as he reached, being a young teenager going into a, a, an adult, his country's identity was being lost. That always inspires these children who watch specific things to be highly patriotic. Hitler was nothing less than patriotic. Do you hear what I'm telling you? There was rage in his country when he was growing up. There was a struggle for identity in his country when he was growing up. And he was patriotic. And he said, we're going to bring Germany back again. And that's exactly what he said. That's, that's what he said. Do you know that all tyrants were born in such conditions, were raised in such conditions, and all of them were patriotic? Did you know that? Here's what I'm telling you. A legitimate cause in the beginning Yes, it was. Nobody could foresee how evil these people would be. So what happened? Huh? What happened? What made the person so evil? Hitler made his decision to go forward for the sake of his country. It almost looked like a losing battle. But he never gave up any fault for the identity of the German people. So much so, it became personal. As it became personal, he began to fight for the original identity of his people. He wanted nothing to do with any of the changes everybody else bought in. And Satan came in when he was at the height of his patriotic heart and usurped everything in his life. He was not covered, nor anything else. The people were saying yes, yes to him, yes to that guy. They elected that guy. Are you kidding me? Why did they elect him? Because he was fighting for their country. He was fighting for their identity at all cost. He was fighting for their country. And people saw that as being honorable. And it is. What they didn't see was the darkness that was forming the entire time. The hatred that developed the entire time. See, when hatred and patriotism rise in the same nation at the exact time, a tyrant will come forward. And the purging, they will begin. There are many tyrants over time, and they all develop the exact same way, and I find that odd. You know what else? Here's the biggest thing. These people were not covered. Those who believed in the living God did not cover them. They agreed with them, and that's a mistake. They didn't cover them. They agreed with them. Let me say something that will likely end my career in COT. God did not put us here to agree with the voices in the world. He put us here as the body of Christ to destroy the works of the devil. The devil is after your favorite person. You better know that now. 
You're not here to agree with him. You're not to agree with him. You agree with Christ. You don't agree with him. You intercede for them because you are the body of Christ in the earth. If you don't do that, Satan has already won. You see how vulnerable these people are. The Lord has shown you how vulnerable these people are. How they cannot maintain steps of righteousness in such a vicious world. Somebody has to have their back by way of a holy covering that can only come through God's people. See, in the time of Germany, God's people were over there too, but guess what happened? They agreed with him, tried to prosper from what was happening when they should have covered him. When you agree with forceful sentiment, you cannot come along halfway and say, wait a minute, we got to back down and we got to, you know, you can't do that. You can't do that. You're not going to take a person who's passionate about it. So, so let me make this short. What I'm telling you is this. A tyrant does not begin a tyrant. A tyrant begins a patriot. And then as soon as that tyrant has power, Satan will come into that tyrant, to that person, and cause that person to go astray. It happens over and over again. You have the ability to stop that from happening. Satan will always wait until something is established and here he comes. All of you should know that for your own lives. You're the balance. You are the balance. You know why there's no real set time to prophecy? Because God will always wait upon you. See, here's what I believe. I believe this, that God is long suffering concerning us. Work. That's why it was written that God is not slack concerning his promises that men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. Work. He desires that no one perish outside of him. So time is based upon your agreement with the kingdom of God and the will of God. When you agree with the will of God, you intercede for man on this earth. When you step away from the will of God, you seek to win favor with these men in the earth, and that's a problem. That's when things escalate. Satan will always seek to usurp leadership anywhere. That's how he works. That's what he does. He does it in your households. That's why some of you, you get promoted in your jobs, and then these other thoughts start coming into your mind, thoughts you never had before. Huh? You didn't tell anybody that, did you? Yeah, anybody who's ever been in a leadership role, they understand what I'm saying. Thoughts you never had before will become invasive into your mind. And you'll even ask yourself, where'd that thought come from? Where's this feeling coming from? Somebody will say something the wrong way and all of a sudden, you're infuriated over what they said. As though you have some type of dominance over the person and you'll stop yourself saying, where in the world did that come from? That's how Satan works. He waits until you're in that authoritative position. Then he strikes. And if he can take the whole thing over, through you, he'll do so. That's what a tyrant is. A tyrant is a leader under the wrong influence. Simple and plain. That's what you're here for. You have that ability to fend off the devils and the satans that would desire to usurp leaders in this world. Don't ever look at a leader of anything secular and say that person can push darkness away themselves. They cannot. You are absolutely critical in that role. I just wanted to add that in there. You guys know where I'm going with this. You, you know exactly where I'm going because you've seen it yourselves. What will happen without holiness? Now, having said that, what do you think has happened to those in Gaza? You don't think a tyrant? has been born, a tyrant has been born, a patriotic tyrant who's capturing the attention and the ears of folks that you wouldn't believe. It's almost as if a process has started and now you have these higher countries listening to what they never ever listened to before. Oh my, we got a problem. This act of Israel's seemed to be a winning move to most people, I already gave you my opinion yesterday. This is going to bolster and only seem to show those who have been indoctrinated against Israel. They'll see it as crooked. They'll see it as ruthless. They'll become twice as patriotic. And they will do what they do to the point of death. There are people in the wings that are drawing the eyes and the attention of the whole world among those Gazan people. 
among the Palestinians. I mean, they're drawing attention like you wouldn't believe. It is unusual, but it's happening. And now through this act of the explosive pagers with two waves, you better believe the whole world is going to be drawn in to the sympathy, greater sympathies, when the cries begin. See, it only takes one act of unfairness that the world will deem as unfair for them to stand against Israel completely. And we see that happening every hour. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? I told you yesterday that we're drafting papers yesterday. Some of you saw certain pieces of evidence supporting that today. Oh, you'll see a lot more. The world is enraged. They are. And as we move closer to this time, where God's indignation must be fulfilled, where this appointed time will take place, it is important that we understand the biblical mechanisms in place. Now why in the world does the indignation of the trampling of Jerusalem underfoot have to happen in the first place? Here it is. In the book of Jeremiah, and I'm paraphrasing, God essentially said, Israel, if you will turn back to me, follow me, honor me, do those things I've given you in the first place. The whole world is going to be healed through you. But Israel, if you don't, the whole world will erupt by you. And to date, Israel has been that point of contention that has caused the current eruptions you see in the Middle East. You see what happened there? And because Israel did not turn back to the living God, but they chose rather to believe in themselves rather than the living God. And they did fornicate with other beliefs around them because they integrated external beliefs into their own belief, which is an abomination. They sought to change God's holy days. That's an abomination. And then they were all exiled. Then when they were exiled into Babylon, which they were sent there so God could keep them, correct them and keep them and bring them back home, they went into Babylon and prospered. That's when God says Babylon has become a burden unto him because he sent Israel into Babylon to be corrected. And instead, she prospered. It became even more, some of the people there became even more wicked. They actually went to Babylon and prospered. And that's why you can read that Captain the Burden of Babylon and some of the narratives out there in your Bible where you're reading in Jeremiah. Because Israel had adopted the ways of Babylon, thus she became the daughter of Babylon. God called her the daughter of Babylon a couple times. How she adopted the ways of Babylon. The Lord said, because she did that, he declared his indignation upon that nation to purge it, listen to purge it, and to get everything out of there that does not belong there. Why did Israel go astray in the first place, and why do they keep going astray according to the word of God? Because wickedness is sown in among the righteous there. Those who would follow God are outnumbered by the wicked folks there. God will purge his vineyard, and every single weed in that vineyard is going to be taken out. Every single weed. He even told us how he would do it, and what would mark the height of that purging. We're living in it right now. The Lord said that time of that harvest would take place when wickedness is great in the earth. Do you not know that by policy, Wickedness is approved in the earth. There is no outrage. There's no protest against the wickedness in the earth. But about something simple, the Lord said, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Well, shouldn't we protest from corrupted communications being shown through the airwaves and part of the curriculum for children? Shouldn't we protest? And nobody's protesting that. When was the last time you saw somebody in great number protest cursing? What about showing a little too much skin at the beaches? Nobody's protesting that. Nobody's protesting pornography. Nobody's protesting adultery. Nobody is protesting anything. A good thing the Lord said was good. That's totally obliterated in these times. You don't see a protest for that, do you? You only see a protest when one is trying to be richer than the other or one is trying to dominate the other, and they want power over the other one so they don't have to struggle. You see protests when people are playing this tug-of-war game to see who's the, you know, who's the greatest in the land. 
Now even the laws of this land support iniquity. Now even the laws of this land give a person a right to be totally corrupted and prosperous in the world at the exact same time. And they can promote their garbage and filth and it's protected by law. Nobody's protesting that. So essentially, what has the world become? You guessed it. Babylon. You don't think we live in the end days? We have a nation that is designated by way of a holy covenant. And those inside are desecrating that place? They have protests over there too. Protests that a man should be able to marry a man and a woman should be able to marry a woman right there in the heart of Israel. You have crime there too. Just like the USA. What did the father say? He told you warn all of us. Don't partake of the sins of the place you live in. And if you do that, you won't partake of the plagues that are going to be sent to that place you live in. God will purge his vineyard and take everything that shouldn't be there out. He also said he would have no remorse. He said that. He's serious about his purging. You seeing it now? We live in times where things are just simply explosive. And too many are going to see the indignation of the Middle East blossom. And when Israel is being purged, and those people in it that shouldn't be there are being wiped out, many will have sympathies because they won't know who is who. It's not going to stop the purging, but it will set off a course of events all of us have been anticipating. You're in that season now. When the righteous of the world, it was said when they begin to say, if God has abandoned us, it's over. Can you see the faithful in Israel saying that very thing? When they start losing, they're going to say God has abandoned us. They're going to say that because the word says they're going to say that. And then the fullness of the harvest will happen. In the meanwhile, during that three and a half years, Something will happen worldwide because the whole stage is going to change from that point forward. So as you can see, this issue in the Middle East is escalating quickly. The purging will soon begin. Once the Lord has finished with the purging, he'll put his land back together. Be ready for that. Bob, there's a lot to cover concerning. Some of the intricacies of what is unfolding is just simply amazing. Amazing in one breath, devastating in the other. I do know that tonight large conventional weapons are being discussed and moved as we speak. So from the enemies of Israel, the retaliation is going to be cruel. You remember October 7th, how cruel Hamas was? Imagine that a hundredfold. Somebody says, what about the earth changes, weather, celestial stuff within that three and a half years? I'll tell you something. The Lord has told us distress of nations with perplexity. Can you see how they're going to be distressed? And what we talked about tonight was just the indignation of Israel. That was it. Can you imagine the rest of it happening also? A person will be hard-pressed to really determine, you know, any securities in their life in those days. We're coming to a real point, real pain of a real purging. And it comes so quick. But I do think God, we're not appointed to his wrath. We're not. So you don't have to worry about that. You're not appointed to his wrath. Those who are faithful to him now. Because your opportunity is now. But I wanted you guys to know. Because I'll tell you again. When the missiles fly in the Middle East. And the smoke rises. And when they see with their own eyes. The condition of the nation of Israel. Hearts are going to be broken. People will not understand. There are many who believe that nothing can happen to Israel. That's what they believe. And when those people see Israel under distress, they're going to become just what the Bible said they would be. That falling away, and these folks that blaspheme God in Revelation, more than likely, they walked with him at some point. But when your faith is shaken so badly that you no longer believe, things happen, there's something else taking place too. See, when a person's faith is shaken in that way, some other weird phenomena is happening. I don't even want to say it, but it's happening anyway. People are people are interested in, in the old things again, right? There are a lot of those people who are starting to follow ancient ways. 
not established by the living God, but established by these external beliefs. A real struggle is at hand, and people are they're going to be falling by the wayside. That's going to be bad. But I tell you what, if you know prophecy, if you know the truth, if you guys know the truth, if you know the reason why it has to be purged, you'll be able to see it and say, no, this isn't a mistake. When it comes to Israel, this is our father. We read tonight that the land is going to be parted. You can also see that same thing in the book of Joel, that they parted his land. So you see that in Daniel, you see that in Joel, you see that in other books of the Bible where they parted his land. You see a great military battle take place where Israel is going to be under siege. You see a figure, you can read about him in Revelation that comes forward, who obviously is patriotic concerning what he desired for the world, and the world followed this person. Folks, I hope that uh, as we continue to go through these days, because retaliation is soon to take place, that retaliation is going to kick off and it's going to be devastating. Children are on the table. You guys remember the passage when the Lord described, have you guys read Zephaniah? It describes what's going to happen in Israel. I believe that people should become familiar with that. And really begin to understand that the Lord is truly going to purge his vineyard. And those elements that are still there that will undergo some of this, they're going to be refined. Really refined. It is needful or it wouldn't happen in the first place. We read Revelation, right? Where God has put it in the hearts of the ten kings to give their power and authority to the beast for that one hour, that time of the indignation. Right? We read that. God put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to give their kingdom over to the beast. God did that. What is the Lord doing? So don't ever think evil is on its own and can do what it wants. It's your father bringing these things to a close. But he made us a promise. He said, when iniquity is great in the earth, what will he do? What does the Bible says God will do? When iniquity flourishes in the earth like grass, he, the, 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 um, the scripture says the, the brutish person does not understand this. But that when wickedness flourishes like the grass, it's because it's going to be removed forever. That's a powerful statement. When you see iniquity flourishing, also in another passage in the Bible, right? That's in Joel. You can read that in Joel, Daniel, and some other books. God will say, get you down there. But the harvest is right. The harvest is right. Get down there, angels. Who is he talking to? The angel. The angels that will separate the wheat and the tares. He's going to command them to get down here when the iniquity is great in the earth. But the point is this. When the iniquity is great in the earth, it's because it's going to be removed forever. And here's the part you may not know. We don't have the natural ability to see the spirit of each person. But I can tell you this. This will give you, this, will, this may put a grin on your face. The devastation you're soon to see is going to be gut-wrenching, but only if you don't know the truth. If you know the truth, it's not going to be gut-wrenching. If people saw, I have to name the figure you guys know, which is Hitler. If Hitler had died when he was a teenager, it would have broke hearts. How many hearts did it, did it break when Hitler supposedly or purportedly passed? When they said he passed. How many hearts were broken in the world? You know what the world was saying? Good, he's finally gone. When Saddam Hussein was found in that hole, did the world cry for Saddam Hussein? No, they said, good, he's gone. Why did they say that? Because they were able to see who he actually was. How many of you would cry for Lucifer? If you saw Lucifer being condemned to go to hell, would you cry for Lucifer? You would not. You wouldn't. You're not going to cry for Lucifer. What about the fallen angels? Would you cry for the fallen angels? Probably not. What about demons? Would you cry for actual demons? No, I would not. So I'll tell you this. The Lord gave us a key to something. We just have to hear it in the truthful way. You ready? It's quite revealing. Here it is. And Jesus will say, Depart from me. You worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Anybody knows what that never part means? 
Jesus will say, I never knew you. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means he never knew them. It means they were never one of his. If he never knew them, they were never any of his. If they were never any of his, they did not carry the spirit that you think they carried. You guys hear me? The book of Jude is quite revealing. If you look in the book of Jude, you see something. That there are men of old ordained to be ungodly men walking around like normal people. And they're not normal. They are ordained or destined to become ungodly men. They were born that way. They are wickedness incarnate. They are ancient. You cannot see them because of their skin, but the Lord tells us of their violence. So when you see what you see in the Middle East, as it grows, remember something. Your father never lost control, and he has full accountability of his own children. He does. Try your best to remember that. It will help you. Oh, and by the way, get you get you guys better get ready because that situation in the Middle East combined with what's happening here in the USA, the language packs are being distributed to kind of send all our communications through a funnel. Some of you should have noticed that about some of the new equipment being put up all over the USA. Black boxes, they stand at about, about the level of your chin. I'll say about six foot average for some of you guys. It stands about six feet tall. You're going to see brand new technology on just about every single telephone pole. Many things are changing. Are you guys ready for that? I think you're ready to stand firm for somebody else. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.